Let the record show that this is the case of State of Iowa versus Michelle Lee Bow, defendant, Marion County case FECR 030888. The jury, the attorneys, Ms. Bow, are present in the courtroom at roughly 3 p.m. on May 11th, 2021. Who is the foreperson of the jury? And is it number eight? Yes, Your Honor. Has the jury reached a verdict? We have, Your Honor. Is the verdict unanimous? Yes, it is, Your Honor. I'll have you pass your envelope to the court attendant. Ms. Bode, I'll have you stand and listen to the reading of the verdict. In the matter of the State of Iowa versus Michelle Lee Bowe, we the jury find the defendant guilty of murder in the first degree, verdict form number one. Is that your verdict, members of the jury? So say all of you. Does the state request a polling of the jury? No, sir. Does the defense? No, sir. You can be seated. Members of the jury, uh, I'll now release you from the admonition that I've given you earlier. I'll ask you to stay with us for a moment longer, uh, and then I'll visit with you uh, before you leave the courthouse here today. Michelle Bo, based on the verdict of the jury finding you guilty of murder in the first degree, the court does find that the verdict form is in order and signed by the foreperson. Pursuant to Iowa Code Chapter 811, you are not eligible for bail. Therefore, therefore you are remanded to the custody of the sheriff. The court will order the preparation of a pre-sentence investigation report. Ms. Boat, you are advised that you have the right to file a motion in rest of judgment and a motion for new trial. Those must be filed within 45 days of today's date, but not later than five days before the date set for sentencing. Does the state have a proposed sentencing date? We don't at this time, Your Honor. We'll speak with defense counsel and come up with a date. Anything further on behalf of the state? No, sir. And the defense? No, Your Honor. Very well, Ms. Boat, you're remanded to the custody of the sheriff. And you look at her reaction, she did not seem shocked either. I mean, she knows what she did. I mean, she testified about what she did. We heard it on the witness stand out of her own mouth. So uh, I think the only verdict that would have shocked anyone was anything other than guilty of first-degree premeditated murder. Let's bring in Court TV legal correspondent Chanley Painter, who joins us live from Knoxville, Iowa tonight. Um, Chanley, even though it was not shocking it's still a dramatic moment because still anything can happen and what would have shocked me didn't happen uh, what didn't shock me did happen she was convicted and quickly very quickly i think it's a record for, for court tv less than 45 minutes i think that stems back from when the prosecutor instructed the jury on the verdict form and the jury instructions and he he did so in a quite tedious way but he told them you consider the top count first that's first degree premeditated murder if you unanimously agree that's guilty that's where you stop you don't consider all eight lower or lesser included offenses you don't have to work anymore that's all the work you have to do and that seems to be what happened in this case only if they agreed it was not guilty would they move down the list and consider the lesser included so here that's why it didn't take very long for them to agree they seem to have had their mind made up when they left that courtroom and i just want to mention like you said, inside the courtroom, it's only the jury, it's only the parties, but across the hall, I'm surprised when you played that clip, you could not hear the shouts of joy from across the hall by the family of Tracy Mondeball. When that guilty was read, they shouted inside the overflow room, thank you, Lord, yes, this is what they were waiting for. Tracy Mondeball's son shot out of his seat, Vinny. He was pacing around the room nonstop, just with his head in the air, his hands on his head, tears streaming down his face. 
They were nervous. Like you said, anything could happen with the outcome of this case. They were anticipating a guilty, but they didn't know for sure until it was read. You know, that's, that's a, a fascinating part of, of this trial, right? You've got no one inside the courtroom, so the family, um, here's the verdict together. They're at the courthouse in this overflow room, but not restricted by the admonitions that you would normally have, which is, listen, there's going to be a verdict. If you can't control yourself, get out of the courtroom. So they didn't have to do that. So um, perhaps through all of this strange COVID restrictions that we're under, for a family, it might be a more cathartic moment for them to be able to express themselves at the moment that they, they get the only thing they can get because their loved one never comes back. Never, she'll, she'll never be back. They'll never get closure, but at least uh, in that moment, they got a sense of justice uh, that Michelle Boat was held responsible by this jury. Exactly, and her son, Tracy Mondebaugh's son, told me he was thankful, Vinny, he didn't have to sit in that courtroom. He didn't want to be in the same room as the woman who murdered his mother. He was very clear about that. Didn't want to be anywhere near her. And yes, inside the room, not only the, they were able to make the noise they wanted to make and react to this, but they were able to embrace, stand up, move around the room, hug. Also in the room, and in addition to maybe the victim's assistance coordinator of the prosecutor's office, where with the family, the lieutenant who testified in this case, who worked on this case for almost a year and talked to, actually to Court TV soon after about how he wanted to make sure he did everything right in this case when he investigated it, when he talked to the defendant in the interview, didn't want to make any mistakes. He was in there. He left work, drove all the way from Pella where this happened, where he was working to be here today to hear the verdict in the overflow room standing there and he was quite emotional. He said, this is, this is what it should have been. This is what we've been working for, justice in this case. And you think about, there, there is a level of pressure on, on prosecutors in a case like this, one where the evidence is seemingly overwhelming. You know you've got the person, but you've got to dot the I's, cross the T's, and you've still got to prove everything beyond any and all reasonable doubt, and trials are unpredictable. So for the investigators, for Ed Bull, for everyone else involved in this prosecution team, probably more pressure in a case like this than other cases. Yeah, I would think so. And I, I also spoke to the prosecutor, Ed Bull, and he talked about how fortunate it was for his office to have so much evidence. He had a lot to work with, he said. And so much so that he was able to strategically use the evidence in a way where they didn't give everything away in the opening statement and they didn't give everything away in the case in chief for the prosecution. They saved things for a possible cross-examination for Michelle Boat. Their case was so strong they didn't have to give everything away in the beginning or in their case in chief. And they anticipated that Michelle Boat would take the witness stand. He told us that and he wanted to use certain pieces of evidence on cross-examination and he said he was also mindful of how he crossed the witness, you know, being a female defendant in this case, he didn't want to turn off the jury. And that was also one of the reasons he said he told me that he didn't want to give the closing argument just in case they had some sort of negative reaction to how he was confrontational with the defendant. He wanted to let his co-counsels give the closing. So that was interesting strategically as well. Absolutely. Speaking of closing arguments, so they took place today as well. Let's take a listen uh, to the prosecution. So if in acting to kill Tracy Mondebaugh, the only, the exclusive, the sole reason why she did what she did was a sudden heat of passion, all right. But if there was anything else going on, like malice of forethought, like specific intent, then her actions were not solely because of a heat of passion. Of course she was amped up when she killed Tracy. Mandibaugh. But that passion wasn't solely from whatever happened at the truck. It was from the long history that preceded it. It also has to have been a sudden passion, which was the same say, to say the same thing, right? It wasn't like, oh, I've got no problem with Tracy Mandibaugh before I stepped to her truck to attack her. And then I was, my passions were inflamed because 
of some things that tr she says that Tracy said or did, right? That's what this means. I'm fine, but all of a sudden, boom, something sudden happens that inspires essentially an irresistible passion to kill. You know, Chanley, for us, you, you know, we all went to, we went to law school and we all learned about sudden passion and we learned about the classic cases. For jurors, they have no background like that. So the first time they're hearing about sudden passion and these issues is in this trial. So I think it was really important for the prosecutor to really, as he did, get into the difference between being amped up in the moment and what sudden passion is under the law. Because he makes a great point. I mean, you look at just about any murder, there's going to be that moment of passion that you're amped up at the time of the murder. But under the law, that's not what we mean by sudden passion. Exactly. He explained it perfectly, giving them vivid words and descriptions, examples of what it is and why this isn't manslaughter in this case. And he did this after he walked the jury through almost an hour of why it is first degree murder, why it is malice of forethought. And then he took the time because he knew that's what the defense was going to say to switch the story and say, look, this is why it's not manslaughter. We, manslaughter. we expect the defense to get up here and tell you this, but let me tell you this before you hear it, which is under the law, these are the elements and this is why it isn't met here. He even went further, which I thought was great. He had, of course, the visual PowerPoint, but he had the words on the screen describing that it's not just a sudden passion with a provocation, but there's some sort of conduct that's required under the law that the defendant has to do to overcome this passion, this conduct, this sudden irresistible passion. That's missing here, he said. This is missing here. In fact, the opposite occurs, is what he told the jury. She actually took the time to step away from this confrontation and go to her car, pick up the knife, and returned to it, and she chose to stab Tracy Mondebon. And he said multiple times. Of course, the defense didn't say that. But yes, you're, he took the time to explain it in the way that this jury would understand. Because like you said, they aren't attorneys. The, the jury instructions are legalese too, Vinny. So just to help make it a little bit easier to follow. And obviously, it worked. It didn't take them long to decide. Absolutely. Because, I mean, most murders that take place, you know, especially a stabbing, it's going to be some level of passion, but you've got to distinguish the what it means under the law versus what, you know, it just sort of means in day-to-day -day life. And, there, and there's a very big, big difference, and I think he did a great job there. Uh, the defense closing argument, interesting, because somehow Elmer Fudd made his way into the argument. Haven't heard that name in a while. Let's take a listen. So I assume possibly there's going to be a return to this theme because Mr. Bull brought it up in opening that Michelle was hunting. She was a hunter, hunting down Tracy. A hunter, the only hunter, Elmer Fudd. He wasn't very, ever very successful because Describing Michelle as a hunter is ridiculous. There's months that go by. I mean, what, what is the hunt? What, what is the, the pointless wandering around, checking things out? And all of this, all of this, quote, hunting behavior occurred before March 22nd, when she dealt with, uh, or went to mental health treatment and was discharged. You know, at, at this point, I just, the, the, one of the big differences between being a prosecutor and a defense attorney is defense attorneys really don't get to pick the cases, right? Prosecutors choose which cases to indict, which ones to take to trial. If they don't want to take it to trial, they give a sweetheart deal or they just drop the charges. The defense doesn't have that option. So you got to try a case that, uh, like this where the facts are just terrible for you, your, your client is terrible for you. Um, so I don't want to attack the defense tonight. I mean, the case is what it is, and they were stuck with some really, really bad facts. 
they really were in a difficult client. Then you remember in the court file, she actually wrote a, a letter to the judge asking for a new attorney because every time I called his office, he doesn't answer the phone. And you could tell in pretrial hearings a little bit of contention between client and the attorney. And you, you're right, he didn't choose this client. They didn't choose this case, but it's his job. And it's Michelle Boat's constitutional right to have the best defense provided here. And they did what they could with this set of facts, arguing creatively. In the court file, they made some creative arguments. They kept evidence out of this case, Vinny, that the prosecution wanted into the trial. They had some victories in that court file and winning some of those pretrial motions. But here with the circumstances all together, I was impressed with what they were able to do with what they had. And they were just very nice people. If you meet them in person, they're nice. And I could tell the rapport between the attorneys inside the courtroom as well. And that just shows professionalism all the way around. And it's the only way the system works. A vigorous defense for every defendant who's on trial. That has to be a given. Otherwise, our entire system falls apart. And, and they did their job. And, and the jury did their job. Prosecutors did their job. And justice was delivered today. Chanley Painter, uh, we will speak again. Thank you so much.